Hey guys, welcome back to 15-1 part 2. So when we have a Supreme Court Chief Justice that is significant and there are a lot of important rulings that come out of the time when he is the Chief Justice, we refer to that term as his last name. So we have the Marshall Court early during Jefferson's presidency, for instance, and he's the one who was there for Marbury versus Madison and Gibbons versus Ogden and a whole bunch of early court rulings. And we have the Warren Court, um, which is the big um, period of time in the middle 20th century when Earl Warren was Chief Justice and took a rather activist approach and a lot of forward thinking rulings. And so what we're going to go through on these next few slides are some really important Supreme Court cases. In the traditional test, um, I tend to have you have to memorize these, but I don't think that's going to happen in this case. So what might happen is that you have to talk about a court case in detail or something. I don't know. I'll figure it out over spring break and I'll get back to you on that. Uh, so some of the things that they talked about included reapportionment, um, which has to do with how votes are counted, especially for um, electoral college votes. So if we think about Oregon, for instance, and maybe I'll, I'll try to pull up a map of um, Oregon's uh, representative districts. There we go. We'll see if we got the state one or if we get the national one. Let's go for that one. So we have this map that shows us our representative districts, okay? And this is what we're talking about with reapportionment. Right now, based on the last census, which would have been the census of 2000, okay, they had to provide equal population districts. So there's an equal population that lives here, that lives there, that lives there, that lives here, and that lives here. Notice all of everybody east of the mountains for the most part is in one representative district. Okay, When we have this new census that's happening right now, speculation is that not only are we going to get another representative, okay, but we are also going to um, have to redraw all of this. And there should be another district that pops up over here because we're getting so many people. So what are they going to do? Are they going to maybe draw a line this way and make a whole new district um, in the south? Or are they going to come up with some new system? But before these two Supreme Court cases, what was happening was states were drawing the lines in such a way as to um, make certain populations have a stronger voice than others. And today we call this practice gerrymandering in which you get maps that look really, really goofy because you're trying to um, turn certain colored areas into red, meaning Republican, or blue, meaning Democrat. Let's get back to this. And so we're talking about reapportionment and how the districts are drawn. And we're going to see that after we get through Baker versus Carr, which is the first of these two cases, and we get to Reynolds versus Sims, which is the second, this one's in 1964, the Supreme Court's going to say, you know what, when you're redrawing those lines, you have to have them with all the sentences having equal weight, which means that you have to have equal amounts of people in these districts, district lines. So it's going to boost the power of racial minorities that are living in crowded city areas, and it's going to um, change how votes are counted to try to give all people more or less a one man, one vote type of idea. You're going to have people in your future that are going to argue that that's not really the case, especially with the way the Electoral College works. Um, but these two cases, which I'll hit upon again in a few moments, um, get us one step for closer to everyone having more or less an equal vote when it comes to the Electoral College and the way that works. With the Electoral College, hmm, how to describe it? We all vote. And it's the popular vote. And then the way it is for almost every single state, whoever gets the majority of the popular vote in that state gets all of the elector votes. And the number of electors that we have for our state is the number of representatives plus the number of senators. And so we have seven, okay? We have five representatives, we have two senators, so we get seven electoral votes. All seven of our electoral votes go to whoever gets the majority of the votes in the state on election day for president. 
And in Oregon in the last couple of decades, of course, it's always been the Democratic or the blue candidate. It could be 51 to 49 percent in all of our electoral votes go to that 51 percent um, vote getter, the Democrat in most cases for Oregon. Uh, that's one of the biggest complaints about the Electoral College is that it's a winner takes all in the states. Not all states are always like that, um, but that's how it is right now. Another thing that they do is they extend due process. So the 14th Amendment, uh, one of the three uh, Civil War amendments, uh, basically says that all people are entitled to the same rights and laws should be administered fairly to every single person who is a citizen. Well, because the southern states had been changing that with their Jim Crow laws, the 17th Amendment is going to kind of remind that. Um, the Supreme Court case is going to uphold several different decisions are going to make several different decisions that are going to require all of the states to administer the Bill of Rights and due process fairly to every single individual. And as we can guess, African Americans especially are going to have their rights denied a lot. Although in the cases we're going to look at, it's going to be um, a wide variety of people that are going to have their uh, due process rights violated. The court also deals with prayer and privacy, um, especially as it applies to school situations, public school situations. And then we have um, this case of Griswold versus Connecticut. So when Margaret Sainer first started opening her birth control clinics and providing birth control for women um, in the, the teens and the 20s, she was quickly shut down. And eventually, we're going to see birth control gain um, more acceptance in certain circles of people, but the state of Connecticut, for instance, is going to require that the woman um, explain why she wants the birth control and it can only be prescribed to married women. It cannot be prescribed to single women. And so Griswold, uh, which may or may not have been the name of the person, sometimes they take on fake names to protect privacy, takes the state of Connecticut to court saying that the questions that the doctor asks when she wants access to birth control violates her right to privacy. And so what we see is that the court's going to agree. So this decision comes down in 1965, and what the court's going to decide is if a woman wants access to birth control, the doctor cannot deny that access to birth control um, based on anything that's relevant to her, her living situation. He can only deny access to birth control uh, for health reasons. Now, the Catholic Church is going to be in a whole different place at this point in time. They're going to say no birth control, period, and they're going to continue to say that through the 70s and even um, a lot of conservative families, even through today. But what this opens up is that if single women want access to birth control, they can get it. Their doctor cannot deny it to them. So if we look at the year of this case, which is 1965, and we fast forward just a couple years to the summer of love and free love movement with the counterculture or the hippie movement, we can see a, a clear cause and effect to um, the way the hippies express their freedom and love and the fact that birth control is now widely available to any woman who wants access to it. And so um, an interesting little cause and effect that we see here with just this one particular case. So we're going to look at a couple different slides here that are going to have major decisions of the Warren Court. I want you to stop attempting to take notes, ladies, okay, and just listen, okay? The civil rights movement, or civil rights cases that the Warren Court decides between 1954, which is before Kennedy's term, through 1967, which is through Johnson, okay? There's multiple important cases here. We see Brown versus the Board of Education. So Brown versus the Board. Brown is one of 20-some families in Topeka, Kansas, that think it is unfair and unconstitutional to require their African-American children to bus great distances to a black school when there is a white school in the neighborhood. That's the, the, the premise or the background for this case. The NAACP agrees, and so Thurgood Marshall is the main lawyer for this case. And he ends up actually becoming the first African-American Supreme Court justice, which is really cool. So he's one of many that have um, presented cases in front of the Supreme Court and then end up being a justice on the Supreme Court. So what Marshall does is he gathers together actually psychologists that are able to prove that African-American children see themselves as inferior 
just because they are segregated and separated from the white school children. And so they pull in a lot of science, which makes it really difficult for the court to deny the fact that segregation in public schools is inherently unconstitutional. And so the court says you have to desegregate schools. You have to allow blacks to go to white schools. And if it, however you draw the district lines, well, what's going to happen is the southern schools are going to be um, very slow in going along with this because the mandate says in due deliberate speed. And that's a very vague term. What is due deliberate speed? And so we see one school district in Virginia that actually shuts down and does not offer public school because they do not want to allow African Americans to come to the public schools. And most everyone in the county that is white is wealthy enough and they all send their kids to private schools. We're going to see places like Little Rock, Arkansas that are going to refuse to cooperate until the National Guard eventually comes in. We're going to see governors that are going to refuse to cooperate with this in their states until the army comes in. So it's going to take 10 plus years before um, we get true desegregation. There's going to be a separate case called Brown II that happens a year or two later that just explains how we can force the desegregation. And the next case is Baker versus Carr, um, which is asking for states to redraw electoral districts, and I kind of already mentioned this, and then Reynolds versus Sims, which is the one man, one vote, so that you have um, state legislative districts being equal in population. Heart of Atlanta Motel is an interesting case. Heart of Atlanta Motel was a motel along interstate highways in, of course, inner city Atlanta. And they were refusing to rent rooms to African Americans, many of whom were long distance truck drivers, so like semi-truck drivers. And what the court was, a, a, one of the things that the court was, a, was able to draw upon was the fact that this hotel, while renting to white truck drivers, went, renting to white travelers, by denying black truck drivers the right to stay there, they were actually interfering with interstate commerce and decided, and also because you are providing public accommodations for anyone, um, you have to provide public accommodations for African Americans too. So earlier in the year, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, and one of the things that the Heart of Atlanta Motel was trying to contest was the fact that this was unconstitutional. And the court, excuse me, the court said, nope, it's constitutional and you can no longer not rent rooms to African Americans. Loving versus Virginia was, um, Loving uh, was his last name, taking the state of Virginia to court. And um, they were an, a, an African American uh, woman and a white man who wanted to get married. And the state of Virginia, along with a whole bunch of other states, actually did not allow interracial marriage. Um, and they took it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's like, it doesn't matter what race you are, marriage certificates cannot be denied uh, being issued based on race. And so it's going to knock down those um, interracial marriage bans in a bunch of southern states. Looking at due process, again, you're just listening to me right now. If you want to go back and write it down later, you can rewind, you can pause. Um, so in all of these cases... It is an individual whose due process right was, rights were offended or ignored against a state or a government employee. And so versus Ohio, the state of Ohio, Illinois, or Arizona. So this is a case of Dorley Ma uh, Map. who, um, oh, let me show you. So if you want to look at more of these cases, there is a website called oyes.org that gives you really clear cut information on case. So see, it's oyes. Oyes.org. So it's Dor Dal Re, sorry, Dal Re map. So she was convicted of possessing obscene materials after allowing police to come into her, her home searching for a fugitive. And so they came in looking for a fugitive, but they found that she had some obscene materials, okay? They did not have a search warrant for the materials, but they took them and they brought her to court and charged her, and she had to go to jail. And so because they did not have um, the search warrant, they could not use those materials to uh, convict her in court. They could not use those materials in court. And so this is important um, for a couple different reasons, but let me scroll down just a little bit more for this OAS case. So it shows you the justices, okay? If they're whited out, it shows you like a minority opinion. If there's no person there, that means they didn't rule in that particular time. 
it tells you it was a six to three decision for for map okay and it tells you about the opinions that were written down here this is an amazing website for any of these cases that you want to look up okay real straight simple stuff and it gives you more information if you want to look at more information so we go back to Dalry's case um, here's how it applies to you for instance so say the police um, show up with a search warrant at your house looking for drug paraphernalia but while they're looking for drug paraphernalia, they happen to see your stash of illegal weapons in your closet. They can do absolutely nothing about those illegal weapons at the time. They cannot collect them. All they can do is go back to the judge and back to a grand jury and ask for an additional search warrant saying that now they want to look for illegal weapons. If the original search warrant said only drug paraphernalia, they cannot pick up anything else. Okay, So it protects you when it comes to illegally seized evidence. Gideon versus Wainwright. Look up the picture of Gideon. He's a cute little old man. Gideon uh, steals cigarettes from a cigarette machine at a pool hall that he frequented. I think it was in Florida. Um, he ends up in court. He cannot afford a lawyer. He tries to defend himself and does a relatively pathetic job at it. And so um, it uh, shows or it, the, the court came up with this reiterated basically this right that everyone's entitled to um, a lawyer, a court-appointed attorney if they cannot afford one of their own. Escobedo versus Illinois is another one, was arrested, was questioned, but did not have his attorney present during police questioning, where the attorney can tell him, don't say that, stop talking, um, my client will talk to you later. And so um, now, yes, you do indeed have a right to an attorney during police questioning. If you read the Fourth through Eighth Amendments, it doesn't make these rights abundantly clear, okay? And so what we finally get then, all of these build up to the case of Miranda versus Arizona. So Ernesto Miranda is arrested and just blabs about not just the crime that the police are looking at in particular, but other crimes that he's been a part of, he's witnessed to, or he knows about. He blabs because he doesn't know he has the right to remain silent. And so what finally happens from this case is police have to inform suspects when they are being arrested of all of these rights, okay, that you're afforded an attorney, that you do not have to speak unless an attorney is present, um, and all of these rights that we hear on the, the, the procedural shows, okay? Every time you're arrested, you have to hear those rights, okay? And so that's why we call them the Miranda rights, because they came from the Miranda decision. Again, if you're interested in these, there's some great videos online you can look at, um, and there's also the OIA site that you can look at. Finally, in dealing with uh, freedom of religion and freedom of speech, we have three cases to mention. Engel versus Vitale says that state-mandated prayer in public schools is not um, allowed, and Abington School District versus Shemp says state-mandated Bible readings is not allowed. So what that means is they cannot require you to participate in these activities. So some schools now, public schools, have a moment of silence in which you can pray, you can meditate, you can do whatever you want, but they cannot require you to participate in a prayer to a Christian God. And then the state mandated Bible readings. Um, it, it could be that you can still have Bible readings in like a world literature type of class, but starting the day with a Bible reading that everyone has to participate in is no longer legal. The last one here has to do with freedom of speech. It's the New York Times um, versus Sullivan. And um, yep, it's the newspaper. So what this one comes up with is really important to celebrities and anyone in the media. They can sue the media, whether we're talking about newspaper, television shows, TMZ, um, YouTube bloggers, whoever they can, they would need to sue. They can sue for libel, which means lying, basically, in certain circumstances, but not in all circumstances, okay? What the celebrities or the companies have to prove is that there was a a loss or a damage to reputation or ability to earn income from the story that was printed. So say TMZ runs a story talking about how some celebrity is a major drug user and nobody's going to start booking this person for movies, okay? They're too much of a liability. If the movie star can prove, number one, that they're not a drug user, and number two, that they have lost movie deals because of the lies that TMZ spread, then they can sue TMZ for damages. 
If, though, TMZ runs a story and says that, you know, Hillary Clinton is an alien or something like that, Hillary's not going to be able to really do anything about that. Because for starters, most of us are going to be intelligent enough to realize that's a lie. And it's not going to do any real damage to her reputation. People are not going to suddenly think that she's an alien. You can chuckle all you want right now. Um, so you have to prove that there were damages. This applies also to companies. So years ago, there was... Um, there was stories that went around about how there were syringes that were found in cans of Pepsi or something like that. And eventually we find out that someone faked it, but the sales of Pepsi went down like incredibly. Pepsi then is able to sue that individual for the lies that they spread that damaged their bottom line, basically. So um, that's what this New York Times versus Sullivan case is all about. So if you're going to be, you know, a, a TMZ type reporter in the future, just make sure that your stories are so unbelievable that um, they will not damage reputations or cost anyone lost wages. All right, this is the end of this second show. Um, I'm going to do my best to uh, get it loaded whenever Thad's done with his online meeting with his boss. Um, and then I will post the next section uh, when I'm able to do that too, section two.